Well, thank you for the introduction and thank you to the organisers for their kind invitation for me to come and speak to you today and for them agreeing to um, my replacing um, the leader of my group, Professor Vladimir Falco. Um, I'll just be telling you a little bit about, um, about some of the other, um, one particular member of the family of 2D materials, um, indium cyanide and gallium cyanide. So, I'm sure you've been all aware and heard about in this workshop, graphene kicked all off around 15 years ago, the isolation in 2004, and since then there's been quite an explosion of various different materials um, with various different properties. It's then starting with you know, the semi-metallic graphene we talked about, semiconducting, um, MOS2 and so on. So I'll be focusing today on the layered 3-6 semiconductors, particularly gamma cyanide, indium cyanide. Um, so when I talk about a monolayer, uh, we're really thinking of four atomic layers, strongly covalent and bonded. You've got two layers of indium atoms, um, and then out of, on the outside of those two layers, selenium. From the top, you've got the familiar honeycomb lattice, but with, so one of the sublattices has the indium atoms, and the other one has the selenium atoms. So when you hear about you, so when you say you've got two atomic layers of indium cyanide, you, in reality you have sort of two times four. So it's like, it is different from graphene in that respect. Um, when you make this into a few layers in bulk, um, the selenium atoms like to avoid each other. So you see that you've got the orange selenium atoms are above the middle of a triangle of the selenium atoms in the layer below. If you look from the side view, you essentially got um, a constant relative shift. So each time you add one layer on the top, you shift it. Um, and so the actual primitive unit cell for, one of the, for the bulk crystal it just has one atomic layer, but you'll quite often see people choosing a unit cell of three layers, because then you can have C axis along Z. So it's often known as the 3R polytype for that reason. So um, just to familiarise you with the bulk crystal, it's a um, direct gap semiconductor, band gap of around 1.3 electron volts, um, you get very nice excitonic resonances um, in your absorption. Exiton binding is about 15 milliEV, so relatively small um, in the bulk. And um, what is surprising, however, is you've got light conduction band electrons, but um, the effective masses out of plane, so electron movement momentum along Z, are lighter than the effective masses of the electrons moving in plane. So despite the fact that you can quite easily, you know, mechanically exfoliate or grow these crystals to be stable in one or two or three layers, um, you've still got quite a strong dependence on electron momentum of energy for electrons moving out of plane. So this will make, suggest that when we do try to make one layer and a few layers of these crystals that we expect quite small changes, quite strong changes to it. And then the other thing to point out is that comparatively the holes in plane are quite a bit heavier. So if we go straight to the DFT bands, um, so as pointed out, we've got quite light electron effective masses, but quite heavy holes. And although where it's direct in the bulk, it's now slightly indirect. You've got a slight offset in the valence band maximum developing and quite heavy, almost flat, flat bands here. Um, and this is co confirmed by angle resolved photo emission um, for CVD growing gallium cyanide. <coughs> so uh, most of the talk on focusing indium cyanide is because it's the most stable in ambient conditions. Um, still not perfectly stable, it is best to try and find, um, find some form of capsation control come to, again, first by Neil Wilson at Warwick in the UK, um, angle of the photo emission, a similar thing where you can just see, you see the slight offset in the bone span maximum. Um, whereas the holes, they're almost flat. If we could get, if we manage to hold dope here, there's potential for some interesting physics there. People have done first principle studies predicting ferromagnetism on hole doping and potentially charge density waves. Um, but the Fermi level is thought to lie really quite close to the conduction band edge, so there ha it hasn't been very much work on, 
whole dose stuff. Most of the studies done are on um, N-type indium cyanide. So one way, one way we model this, we have the DFT, the LDA. Um, into, once you've decided on the crystal structure for the band energetics, then the various functionals are pretty similar unless you're prepared to go to the hybrid level, in which case once you want to go into the bilayer and anything up beyond that, it gets really very expensive and quite difficult to do. So because we're interested in seeing how the crystal varies with thickness, we've built a tight binding model um, and we fit that to a scissor corrected monolayer. So scissor correction is that we essentially um, assume that the DFT is giving you correct results apart from the size of the cap itself. So you can take your gap, you can take your bands and just rigidly shift them with respect to each other and, and just leave everything else unchanged. Provided you do it with your eyes open, provided you do it carefully, it generally tends to work. Um, and then the other thing we do is, so we fit the energetics, but we also need to check the orbital decomposition. So this is, um, we project the FD wave functions onto the S and P orbitals of the indium, they're the M atoms, the selenium, the X atoms. And we look and we compare that with the same, same procedure for the type binding orbitals. Um, and it has to be S and P orbitals, both indium and selenium, because of the decomposition near the band edges has both <coughs> S and P contributions. And important thing to notice, so we've got good qualitative, agree qualitative agreement between the two, um, the DFT and the cis type binding. We also can note, it's quite important for the properties of indium selenide, if you look at the PZ contributions on the far right panel on in, in indium selenide, on the seleniums, you've got strong contribution to PZ orbitals. So you've got, if you look at selenium atoms, the outer layers, you've got PZ orbitals poking out quite a long way towards when you start them towards the next layer. So the layers next to each other overlap. So the PZ orbitals have quite good overlap and quite strong electronic coupling. So that's, that's actually the reason behind the light effective mass and strong changes in properties on the internal number of layers. So if we go to few layer, um, this is essentially what it looks like. So you can just see this in the conduction and valence state. You've got this very strong splitting um, and the gap goes, you can see the progression in the gap from very slightly indirect and this offset gets tiny. It's still just about there for five layers, but it's almost impossible to see by that point. Um, and then if we look at the dependence on gaps and number of layers, it's as I said before, about 1.3 EV in the bulk, um, but it goes all the way up to around 2.8, 2.9 for the monolayer. So you've got really quite strong dependence on the crystal thickness. Um, so this allows you to tune your band gap to, to approach a desired value. So up until this point, we haven't looked at spin orbit coupling for the band energetics. Um, in one sense, that's fine. Um, in terms of the gap itself and the behavior, of the conduction band particularly, it's really quite small. It's not like, let's say, the transition metal that I have hydrogenized, where you have splitting several hundred milliEV at the band edge. Even when you go to the K point, it's really quite small. Um, but if you look at the um, deeper bands at the gamma point, which, are, which were degenerate, they were formed of PXPY orbitals, they have been quite strongly split. So if you're interested in some of the deeper bands, and also some of the optical selection rules, then you have to consider it. Um, so if we look at the RPES, this is um, just overlaying some DFT results. If you don't include spin orbit, you get just two bands going between them. Um, and so it has to be the, sort of the early ones um, weren't quite matching that bit, and it's important to include it, even though there's no actual splitting due to time reversal because the mandate is at gamma point. Um, and just a schematic for the selection rules. Um, so without spin orbit coupling, um, the country valence states are both singularly degenerate. Um, they've got PZ orbitals, same orbital angular momentum, so by conservation you can only excite with outer plane polarized light. And if you're trying to observe some optical transitions for outer plane polarized light for a 2D flake, it's challenging because you're, if, say you emit an outer plane polarized photon, the photon heads off 
in the plane of your crystal, so you don't manage to observe it. Whereas this B line transition, transition from these deeper valence states, um, is active within plane polarized light, so that's a lot easier to observe. If we have inclusive in orbit, then these bands, these deeper bands, that you lift the orbital degeneracy, but you also hybridize V1 with V, so you mix the you mix the selection rules, you mix the polarization characteristics, the interband transitions, and now you are able to um, couple to the principal interband transition within plane polarized light, which when you're trying to observe social luminescence or whatever at normal incidence is, is an important factor to be considering. So looking at the optics, um, so these are absorptions from tight binding. Um, and an important things to note is that, so this blue line down here is the coupling of the principal interband transition to the in-plane polarised light. This would be zero if that's been orbit. It's still pretty small, and you can see it's getting very small as you approach the bulk. So on works, in historical works and literature on the bulk crystal, it is but it's said it's only active for out-of-plane polarisation, which is correct. But as you get to smaller numbers of theirs, you do get this finite in-plane characteristic. The black line is the coupling to our plane polarized light for, if you say it's a shine incident light at 45 degrees to the crystal surface, and that's much stronger. And then the red line is the um, deeper B line state, um, the V1 to C <coughs> conduction, and that's um, coupling much more strongly to in plane polarized light. Um, as I mentioned before, um, it's quite common, certainly in Manchester, that we, cut, we um, encapsulate the 2D materials. Indium cyanide is more stable than gallium cyanide, but still you're losing about a layer every few days to degradation, um, it becoming indium oxide, so you lose the selenium quite, quite easily. Um, so encapsulate it with, with boron nitride, it's got a large gap, it's atomic flat, so we can um, hope not to disturb the properties of the indium cyanide too much. Um, and we normally will build heterostructures, contact it with graphene for the transport experiments. Um, and all this construction of devices is done in an inert atmosphere, in a glove box, in order to, to ensure high quality device manufacture. Um, and indeed, we do get good mobility for a 2D semiconductor, um, up to around 10 to the 4. This is for a six day device. Um, and this is that the order magnitude better than what you normally get with the transition metal die can collagenize and so on. Um, but it just highlights the importance of the encapsulation um, on the device properties. And again, it's the, one of the contributing factors is this light effective mass to, the, um, to ensuring a high mobility. Um, so the optics, um, the experimental photoluminescence spectra, and again, we can see this very strong dependence on, on the, of the band gap, of the optical transition on the number of layers. Um, and right down to the monolayer. The monolayer is a, um, is, you've got two peaks. You've got the A transition and the B transition very close to each other. And then the next cluster of peaks is just the B transition. And then as you go to large number of layers, you get the decrease in energy, as we expect. You also get an increase in the photoluminescence spectra. Now, I've just... A few slides back, I said that the coupling between plain polarized light gets weaker for thicker crystals. So this increase in strength is actually due to the um, gap becoming more direct. So I was showing a slightly indirect gap for the thinnest materials. As you go to hands and layers, it becomes more direct. Um, these were at room temperature. And at the monolayer, the band offset from gamma is about um, 50 milliEV 2KT, so that's why you get this decrease in strength. As soon as you go to thicker crystals, the gap becomes direct and you can get a strong photoluminescence once more. Um, and it's more polarization, so I was saying about how, how it can be very hard to properly observe um, our plane polarized transitions for these monolayer flakes or few layer flakes. Um, so an approach that has been taken is to cut out little lamellae from these flakes and then you can pick them up and rotate them 
So then you can actually see the edge of the flake and you can detect photons coming out of the edge of the flake. So these are photoluminescence spectra for six layer crystals. Um, so on the left, you are um, <coughs> exciting. The bottom one is when you excite out of plane polarization. The red one is for in plane and the green one's in between. And you get the strongest response for the outer plane excitation, as we expect. And just check if we rotate the crystal, keeping the, the, the light polarization the same, then the, the lines swap around. So have to be confirming this behavior of the principal interband transition being dominantly out of plane polarized. And um, referring back to Gangsan, the Gangsan ID is even more unstable than Indium Sand ID, so there's been comparatively quite a bit less work on it. But since, as, as the method of encapsulation has become more popular, this thing started to appear. So this is um, Gangnam Sand is quite similar, really, to Indium Sand aside from the fact that it's got quite a large, larger band gap. And this is exploited here. You have um, a heterostructure with Minium Sand and some Gangnam Sand on top. Um, and in the photon energies, you've got PL up to you know, 2.1, 2.2 EV for the Gallium Sennite flakes. You've then got the Indium Sennite bilayer PL at around 1.9 EV. And then because you've built this hexa structure, you can get these interlayer excitons where an electron on the Indium Sennite recombines with a hole on the Gallium Sennite, that's got type 2 band alignment. And this allows you to further extend the tunability of band gaps that you might be able to obtain. Um, and potentially also build these devices um, because you've got the outer plane polarized light, the photon comes out in plane, so you can put these into a potential type of ring laser. You can either punch them optically or pump using electroluminescence. So I've explored gaps covering the visible spectrum. One of the possibilities that we can look into is um, into subband optics. So, if you're familiar with the quantum cascade laser, quantum wells, and so on, um, it's a simply it's basically the same um, principle. You know, a few layer two D material is is a kind of quantum well. So, if we take the bulk um, dispersion in cyanide on the right, and we confine the crystal, confine the electrons, you can imagine discretizing that band into into a set of subbands. Um, and that set of subbands is the same number of layers. So you have three layers, three subbands, four layers, four subbands, and so on. And um, these subband transitions are covering ranges from a hundred milli EV for a few layers down to tens of milli EV for thicker crystals. Um, this is you know, it's, it, what, it's what has been done for the quantum cascade lasers and so on. It's a similar, very similar principle to access these lo lower energies that extend the optical functionality in the light. <laughs> so in conclusion, the cell light had a very strong band gap variation number of layers because of this um, strong electronic coupling despite the weak crystalline coupling. Um, got light conduction effect mass and get high mobility, um, be able to observe the quantum hole effect in a few layer in the cell light system. And the um, wide band gap range that, and optical functionality of achieving new cyanide is um, potentially very useful for applications. Um, so I'd like to thank all the various collaborators I've worked with, particularly um, the group leader, Professor Andrea Falco, Victor Zagomi, who has worked on, a, who's done most of the DFT calculations brought here, and the group of um, Roman Gorbachev, who um, heads up the um, cleaning facilities and fabrication group at at the Graphene Institute. So thank you.